All right, so we're going to switch into a new chapter, and this chapter is all about radical chemistry. So let's briefly do an introduction to radical chemistry. We've seen a lot of reactions that involve the making and breaking of bonds. So an example situation could be where we have two atoms that are covalently bonded together. And in this situation, we could have one atom get kicked off. So if we think about this reaction, what's happening to X? Is X going to be a positive charge or a negative charge if Y leaves? It'll be a positive charge, right? because it will have lost its electrons, where Y, on the other hand, will get the electrons from that covalent bond, giving it a negative charge. This is referred to as heterolytic cleavage. So then the question is, well, what does it mean when we say heterolytic cleavage? What does hetero mean in the general sense? Different, right? So in this case, one atom is getting a different number of electrons than the other atom, right? It's not being split evenly between the two. So in this case, we're always going to generate a cation and an anion. All right, let's compare this to homolytic cleavage. We'll do the same situation where we've got X and Y but in homolytic cleavage, Y doesn't get all the electrons. Instead, the covalent bond pair will be split evenly. So Y will get one electron, and then X will get the other. One thing I did want to point your attention to is the arrows that I used here. So in the previous example, I used an arrow that looked like that, right? If I have an arrow with two barbs on it, what does that indicate? two electrons. This is different than an arrow with a single barb that is just one electron. So we have to be really careful when we show this by using the appropriate arrows. If you see a double barb that indicates two electrons, that's different than a single arrow or a single barbed arrow, that's one electron. So in the example of homolytic cleavage, X will get one electron and then Y will get one electron, what will the charges be? Neutral. So in this case, X would be neutral and Y would be neutral. So instead of calling these cations or anions, they don't have any charge, we just call these radicals. You can identify radicals because they always have unpaired electrons. Do you think radicals are gonna be very stable? Why not? Because they're unpaired. Electrons like to be paired. We know that from Gen Chem. Why else might they not be stable? Octet rule, right? We're not close to octet. If we have unpaired electrons, we must have seven electrons or one electron in some cases. So in this case, these are relatively unstable due to the unpaired nature of their electrons, which means they do really interesting chemistry. But let's take a look at kind of what occurs during some of these situations. So let's say I have this molecule. I'm going to draw out all of my carbon atoms. And I have a halogen coming off here. What could happen is we could get homolytic cleavage of that carbon halogen bond. So to show this, we would have a single arrow going to the halogen and then a single arrow going to the carbon. So make sure that you don't have a double-headed barb on that. Otherwise, that implies two electrons. And let's try to analyze what this would look like. So when all is said and done, we would get a situation where the molecule kind of flattens out and we would have a P lobe hanging out and that P lobe would contain one of those electrons, right? So it's kind of unique. 
kind of reminds me of forming a carbocation, right? When you form a carbocation, you go through a trigonal planar intermediate where you have a p orbital sticking up and down. The same is true for radical chemistry. So this would be sp2 hybridized which means that it's going to be trigonal planar. And because of that, you're going to have a p orbital kind of sticking up and down. In addition to that, the halogen over here is going to have seven electrons around it. Again, the main thing to watch out for is this unpaired electron means that it's a radical. And then over here, we have a carbon with an unpaired electron, so that would be an organic radical. So we're splitting it into two radical species by doing this homolytic cleavage. Does that make sense? All right, the good news is, like I said, this looks a lot like carbocations, and we've studied carbocations a fair amount in this class. So what's the most stable carbocation? Tertiary? Resonance, Resonance right? So luckily, the same trends apply. So the stability trends for organic radicals is the same as with carbocations. So like we said, resonance is the best, followed by what? Tertiary, followed by secondary, followed by primary, followed by methyl. So methyl radicals are relatively unstable compared to resonant stabilized radicals. So this helps out a lot. We don't have to remember a new trend. We just have to remember it follows the same trends we previously learned. All right. So now the question is, why does resonance stabilize radicals? Well, let's take a look. So if you remember when we talked about resonance, we said the main idea behind resonance is that electrons where you have resonance can be delocalized across multiple bonds and multiple atoms, right? Same thing is true with unpaired electrons. So let's take an example here. And in this example, we've got three hydrogens over here. Got a double bond over here. Let me make this a bit bigger. And we've got two hydrogens over here. And in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to pluck off one of these. So I'm just going to show this as a homolytic cleavage. And we'll dump one electron over there. So what I'm going to do, instead of minus H plus, I'm going to do minus H dot to indicate that we're going to lose that electron and the hydrogen right there. So let's try to predict what our product would look like. We'd still have two hydrogens on the left-hand side left over, right? Is that it? What am I missing? An electron, right? So the electron that I'm missing would be right there. Agreed? Okay, so now we've done the homolytic cleavage. We've ripped off that highlighted hydrogen and its electron. All right. Now we need to figure out how can we move that unpaired electron around with resonance, right? So maybe I take this and I dump it into that bond, right? Can I make a pi bond there? What's wrong? Pi bond has to have two electrons, right? Can't just make a pi bond out of one electron. But maybe it steals a second electron from right next door. That means that that pi electron had one electron stolen from it. Where would the other electron go? Could just end up on the other side. So let me actually clean this arrow up a little bit. All right, so just like with resonance, we'd show this with double-headed arrows. Oops. But this time we'd have a double bond on the other side and our radical would be on the right-hand side. Does that make sense? Yes. 
So if we think about the hybrid structure, where does the radical reside? In between the two external carbons, right? So it's kind of shared between this carbon on the left and this carbon on the right. It doesn't belong to any one in particular. So this would be a radical um, that's distributed among two electrons. That's the weird thing with electrons, right? Because they're so tiny, they can live in multiple locations at once due to their wave-like nature. Yep. What's that? Oh, yeah, and the final structure here, there should be a hydrogen here. Sorry about that. All right, let's try another one. This time I want you to practice the resonance structures. Yeah. So the question was, to move that electron around, do you have to have an adjacent pi bond next door? Yeah, I would say so. Kind of like with resonance with carbocations. Can you do delocalization of a positive charge unless you have a pi bond next door? No, it's really hard. So we're going to follow a lot of the same trends that we saw with delocalizing positive charges with resonance. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Should you draw a hybrid view? You can if you want. For these, I typically just draw the resonance structures. So let's try this one. So this one, we've got an unpaired electron on that top carbon. Let's see if we can figure out all of the different resonance structures for this organic radical. I'll give you a hint, too. Try to show your first arrow coming from the radical. Otherwise, if you start moving pi bonds right away, it gets confusing. All right, so I got us kind of started a little bit. With resonance structures, we're not going to break sigma bonds, right? So what I did was I just drew the sigma bonds out, and my hint is there's only going to be two additional resonance structures. But now let's try the pushing. So my hint was let's start by pushing the unpaired electron first. So can I push this unpaired electron that way? Why not? Yeah, the main problem is this is an sp3 hybridized carbon on the left-hand side. We can't do resonance through an sp3 hybridized carbon, right? So we can't go that direction, but that's okay. Let's try the other direction. So if I do that, I could form half of a pi bond, but that's not really helpful. We need to form a full pi bond. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to steal another electron from that pi bond. 
That means that the leftover electron has to go somewhere. So it's going to actually end up on that bottom carbon. So now let's try to fill in where the bonds would be. This exterior pi bond didn't even get touched in that reaction, so it's still going to be there. Where's our other pi bond going to be? On the top right corner. All right, what else am I missing? Yeah, the electron right here, right? Okay, so now we've made some progress. All right, so same thing. We want to start by pushing our unpaired electron first. I could go this way, but essentially that would just be the same thing in reverse, right? So we just end up going in that direction. That doesn't really help us. So what could we do? Yeah, go towards the other pi bond. So we could say, all right, I'll form half a pi bond using that unpaired electron. Steal one from next door. And then the other electron from that pi bond would end up off the end. So now we could go ahead and we could say, all right, we'd have a pi bond there. Where would our other pi bond be? First carbon coming off the ring, right? So be right there. All right, what else? Electron off the very end. So a lot of this is pretty similar to the resonance structures we've been doing all year long. It just requires more arrows because we have to move individual electrons, not pairs. Yep. Yeah, so I think your question was saying, can we go from our first structure directly to our third structure and skip the second one? Yeah. Theoretically, you could with arrow pushing. However, with resonance, it's good to show all possible resonance structures, right? Okay. Why? Yeah, all of them are occurring. It's a hybrid of all three of them. So if we kind of ignore that middle one, we're ignoring the fact that this carbon right here has radical character, right? So we want to show all three to indicate that the radical is shared between that carbon, that carbon, and that carbon, all simultaneously. Make sense? So it requires a little bit of practice. Um, there's some good practice problems in the book. If you want to get started on those skill builders, it's good just to re-practice some resonance and practice doing it with uh, single-headed arrows rather than double-headed arrows. That's a great question. So is there a major contributor? It's a lot harder with radicals because in this case, none of the octets are filled, right? If we think about octets being filled, this carbon's octet isn't filled, this one's not filled, this one's not filled. So with radicals, it's a lot harder to say which one's major and minor. Yeah. All right. So now let's kind of look at the more generic set of reactions. So there's a bunch of different types of radical reactions. We're just going to go through the generic subclasses really quick. The first one is called radical cleavage. And really this is the same thing as homolytic cleavage, where we said you can have atom X and Y, and if they homolytically cleave, then we're going to split that covalently bound pair of electrons, and one electron will go to each side. So this is essentially what we've been practicing so far. Pretty common type of radical chemistry. What else do you think could happen? The reverse, exactly. Radical coupling. Just like an anion can attack a cation, two radicals can merge together. So it depends on the situation. But sometimes these radicals will just bump into one another and form a new covalent bond. In fact, that's a big part of why UV exposure causes cancer, right? When you get exposed to UV light, you create radicals. Those radicals will bump into other things in your body, form new, covalent bond, new covalent bonds, which disrupts gene regulation. So that's why we want to minimize exposure to sun. All right, next one's a little bit more complicated. This is addition to pi bonds. All right, with addition to pi bonds, you would have one radical that wants to bind to some adjacent pi bond. 
In fact, I'm just going to call this an R group right here. All right, so when we do this, this unpaired electron wants to find some partner to bond with, and so it's going to steal one electron from next door. However, the other electron has to go somewhere. So just like with resonance, it'll hop over to the other side. And we would have a unpaired electron here. Yep. Yeah, so if we think about the carbons, right, we've got one, two, one, two. And carbon one, we know had two hydrogens off of it. They're always going to be on there. So that's why carbon one doesn't end up with the radical, is it's already loaded up with an octet, right? So in this case, the radical will come off of carbon two. All right, I'm just going to erase this for clarity's sake. All right, so that's another common type of radical reaction. In fact, this is how we make a lot of our plastics. So later on, next week, I'll show you how we make things like polyethylene. That's what most water bottles are made out of, polypropylene, PVC pipe. All of it's made through this radical chemistry. All right, next one is elimination. This is similar to elimination with um, hydrocarbons that we've seen already. With elimination, we always make pi bonds, right? So it's kind of like what we're seeing above in reverse. So if we want to do the above reaction in reverse, it makes sense. What you can do is say, well, I want to form a pi bond there. But in order to do that, I have to steal an electron from next door. And then this extra electron will end up on your halogen, or any other atom for that matter. So it's the exact same thing that we're seeing above, just in reverse. A lot of these reactions are reversible. Yeah? Yeah, that's a good question. So what does the X stand for? In this case, it's just a placeholder atom. Uh, it could be a halogen. It could be something like oxygen. Oxygen radicals are pretty common in your body and in organic chemistry. Um, same thing with halogen radicals. In fact, when we get into practicing, you'll see oxygens and halogens are normally involved. All right, let's do the next one. We've got hydrogen abstraction. All right, with hydrogen abstraction, we'll have some sort of radical bump into a hydrocarbon, and it will steal the hydrogen and form a new covalent bond to that hydrogen. But just like before, the other covalent electron has to go somewhere, so it will end up on R. So X will form a covalent bond to hydrogen, and then R will have that leftover electron. What do you think the next one might be, following the same trends? The reverse. the reverse, exactly. Next one is called halogen abstraction. So in this case, you have some sort of radical here. And the halogen might look like Br2, something like that. Or it could even be HBr. It doesn't really matter. In this case, this will reach out and steal a halogen, and then the other halogen atom will get one electron. It looks exactly like above. The only difference is in the above example, we stole a hydrogen atom, or in the bottom reaction, we stole a halogen. Both can occur in organic chemistry. Any questions so far? All right, so now let's jump into the fun stuff. I know, right? Slow my racing heart. <laughs> Halogenation of alkanes. All right, 
before we start, anytime you do radical chemistry, first thing you need to do is identify the hydrogen that you think will be most likely to be abstracted. All right, so let me give you an example situation. So over here, we're going to have a methyl group. This methyl group will be bonded to a carbon. Above here, we'll have a methyl group. Under here, we'll have a methyl group. And over here, we'll have a hydrogen. Which of these hydrogens do you think is most likely going to be abstracted and why? Why the one coming off the central carbon? Let's think about it, right? So a lot of people are instinctually saying that they think this hydrogen is going to be abstracted, right? I think that's a fair bet, but let's take a look at the product. So I'm going to do minus H dot, and we're going to say, all right, that just means that we're losing that highlighted hydrogen and one of those electrons. In fact, let me highlight it so that I'm showing half of those electrons. So here we go. All right, so if we do that, let's draw our product. We've got H dot over here, and what else am I missing? Yeah, dot on the center carbon. So we've got an unpaired electron. So my question is, why didn't we, for example, go after this purple highlighted hydrogen? Why did we go after the yellow one? Well, let's think about it. Why, why is the radical more stable on that central interior carbon? It's tertiary, right? So this is most stable. because it is tertiary. So just like with carbocations, you always want to ask yourself, all right, am I drawing the mechanism where I'm getting the most stable intermediate? The same is true for radicals. If you pluck something off, try to get the most stable radical possible. If we went after this purple hydrogen, what sort of radical would we get? Primary, right? We don't want a primary radical if we can avoid it. All right, so that's the first thing you always want to do when looking at the halogenation of alkanes. All right, now let's take a look at the overall reaction. It's broken down into multiple steps. Step one is initiation. All right, so let's take a look at what initiation is. Initiation is the initial process through which you create a radical. All right, so typically with halogenation reactions, you can initiate radical formation by taking something like Br2 and hitting it with heat and or UV light. You have to have enough energy around to actually break these bonds. So if we do this, just like we've seen, you can get homolytic cleavage where this covalent bond will break and you'll go from a non-radical Br2 to two bromine radicals, both of which are Br dot. So you want to make sure you draw that dot to indicate that they have unpaired electrons. Does that make sense? So we've created a radical from a non-radical. All right, step two is called propagation. That's when your radical reacts but isn't destroyed. All right, so let's see what happens. Well, we've got these bromine radicals floating around. 
And then, like we said, we've got this molecule floating around. I'm just going to abbreviate the methyl groups as CH3. Just like we said above, this hydrogen that we've highlighted is going to be the most reactive species, right? Because it gives us the most stable radical in our next intermediate. So let's try to figure out this arrow pushing. What do you think the arrow pushing will look like if we're going to steal that highlighted hydrogen? See if you can figure it out on your notes. Who thinks they got the arrow pushing right for the next step? Thumbs down if you are lost. Sideways if you're like, yeah, I guessed. All right, <laughs> seeing a lot of thumbs and various ups and downs. All right, so first thing we want to do, is we want to have this halogen abstract this hydrogen. So it's going to steal one of those electrons from that bond and form a new covalent bond between the bromine and hydrogen. However, we have a second electron that has to go somewhere. So it's going to end up on that carbon. So that carbon, I have it drawn kind of as a triangle. Why do I have it drawn that way? It's trigonal planar, right? So it is important to remember that it goes from sp3 over here to an sp2 radical. So we're going to go from tetrahedral to trigonal planar. All right. In the propagation step. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. So in the initiation step, you're asking what's more stable, the bromine radical or Br2? In this case, when we do this radical formation, we might only be making about a percent of this at a time in solution, right? Because it's not very stable. We know radicals aren't very stable. They would rather reform, couple together and form Br2. However, even if we only have 1% in solution, that's enough to continue on into the propagation step. So even though we don't have very much of it, maybe a trace amount, that trace amount will continue finding things to react with. And there's some probability that the next thing it will react with will be the organic molecule. So it's a little bit weird to think about. You don't have to have 100% cleavage in the first reaction in order for the propagation step to start taking off. All right, so now that we've got this, we need to go back to the definition of propagation. During propagation, I said that the initial radical reacts but isn't destroyed. So our initial radical, what was that? Be our dot, right? So we need to regenerate that. We can't destroy it in this process. So then the question is, how can we regenerate our bromine radical? Well, just like Muhammad was saying, when we do that initial propagation, we still have a ton of our starting material around, right? Because not all of it got ripped apart into radicals. Probably 99% of it is still going to be Br2 in solution. Maybe I'm just making up numbers here, so don't take me as 100%. Maybe 99% of it's going to remain a starting material. 1% of it will maybe be split into radicals. That remaining 99% is still floating around in solution. So in this next step, this radical can come and steal one of these halogen atoms from Br2, which means that the other halogen will get kicked off. Now it starts to make a little bit more sense. So this radical over here is now completely regenerated, right? So we've regenerated our radical. 
this is why it's called propagation, right? Because if we think about this, if we regenerate the BR dot, what can that BR dot do? It can find more starting material and continue this loop going around and around and around and around. Yep. So you're asking where did this one come from? Yeah, so like we were saying up here, during that initial initiation step, only a small portion of the BR2 is actually getting ripped apart. The remaining BR2 is just floating around as BR2. So you might have some molecules of BR2 that are just floating around in solution that didn't get ripped apart, that in this second propagation step can fill that last step that I've circled there. So it's kind of weird to think about these not always being 100% complete reactions, but there's still enough to initiate the propagation cycle. Yep? Kind of, yeah. So if we think about this, the initial BR dot, as soon as you form it, is catalytic in that you're always regenerating it. However, it's a little bit weird, right? Because you do need a stoichiometric amount of BR2 here to keep the cycle going. So in that way, it's not a ra radical because it's not created or destroyed in that sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not a catalyst in the true sense that it doesn't get consumed at a stoichiometric rate. But it is catalytic in the sense that you're regenerating it. So I think I see what you're saying there. It's catalytic in that you're regenerating the BR dot, but it's not a true catalyst because you need a full stoichiometric amount. Yep. All right, so now the last step. Last step's pretty easy. It's called termination. And that's where you get rid of your radical. All right, so if we think about the radical that's, that we had during the above processes, we can kind of go ahead and circle them. So I'm going to circle them in purple just for right now. You don't have to in your notes. But in step one, we've got the BR dot radical, right? Same thing down here, so I'm not going to circle it again. We also, during the process, created this radical. That was our organic radical. Any others? The last, one. the last one's still BR dot, right? So really, it looks like during the above process, we either made BR dot radicals, the bromine radicals, or we made the carbon radicals that I've circled. So we have two different radicals floating around. In the termination step, we want to get rid of those, those radicals. So there's a few different probabilities. Option one. Is there some probability of a bromine radical bumping into another bromine radical and just reforming BR2? Right? That's statistically probable that that will happen, that reverse reaction of our initiation step. What do you think another option is? Yeah, so the two organic radicals could have bumped into one another. So maybe one of these carbons over here bumps into another carbon radical. And if we do that, we can actually form new carbon-carbon bonds. In fact, this is really important in plastics manufacturing. All right, what do you think another option is statistically? Yeah, BR reacting with carbon. So maybe we have this organic radical. And we've got a bromine radical. And maybe they just bump into each other, form a new bond. And we get to a product with a carbon-halogen bond. All right, so looking at these, these are all statistically probable in solution. Which one do you think is least likely and why? Mm 
Do you think option one is least likely, option two is least likely, or option three is least likely? Why option two? It requires two bulky things colliding in space, right? Statistically, that's a little less likely. So I'd say that this is the least likely option. All right, meaning option one and option three tend to be the major products, but you still get a little bit of the products from option two, right? All right, so let's kind of take a look at the summary here. All right, the summary for the reaction shown, we could kind of show down here. So I'm just gonna show my starting materials. We reacted our starting material with Br2, and what else? We need a UV light, right? The UV light was essential for that initiation step, so in this case, we wanna include it with the reaction arrows. And the net product of this reaction, Let's kind of take a look at what our net products of the reaction were in the above situation. So let's go ahead up here and say, all right, in the initiation step, we were just making a tiny, tiny amount of our radical initiator, right? So that's kind of not our desired product, the BR dot radicals we only made in a tiny amount. What was our product in step two? This is a product, right? So that's one of the products of that propagation cycle. So that's what we created in the final step. Let's take a look at termination. Is this a product? Kind of, but it was also a reactant. So we don't need to worry about showing it twice, right? Because that's what we're putting into the mixture. We said this one's gonna be a very, very minor product. And then this one's the same as the product shown as above. So really, at the end of this reaction, it seems like the major product that we're going to get out is this one that we've circled here, which kind of makes sense, right? So the net summary for this reaction is we're going to remove the hydrogen that we said gives you the most stable radical, and we're going to replace that hydrogen with a halogen. Pretty simple reaction. All right, then the question is, what could we theoretically do with this now? Yeah, we could do E2 or E1. Can we do substitution? We can't do SN2 substitution. We could do SN1. And this really opens up everything, right? So we think about this, right? This starting material is a hydrocarbon, petroleum product, something you could find in natural gas. Not something super useful in and of itself. But now all of a sudden, we have the power to add on a leaving group. And by adding on that leaving group, we can now do substitution chemistry. We can start doing elimination chemistry that we otherwise couldn't do with this petroleum product that we started with. So it's a really powerful tool that we have to convert things like oil, and natural gas into organic building blocks for making pharmaceuticals or materials. So that's kind of where we're going to end today. Like I said, please make sure that um, this weekend you go through and do the alkyne skill builder problems. Um, otherwise, next week's going to get pretty crammed for you studying-wise.